My name is Keith, and I'll be your guide through storytelling workshops one and two, levels one and two. Um, we're already talking about year number seven and what level three might be. So if you have ideas for that, please see me after the, after the workshops. Um, love to hear, A, what you got out of today, and what you want to do next, but also how we can go deeper next year. Um, quick 60 second bio um, on me, just to kind of give you a sense of who I am and why I'm in front of you. Um, I am a filmmaker, storyteller, and I teach video making at Bay Area Video Coalition. Um, so if you have, uh, get inspired today and want to tell visual stories, you can reach out to me. I have business cards here. I can tell you all about the cool programs that are happening there. That's actually how Faye and I met. Um, the collaboration between Bayback and SFUFF goes back to year one, right? Um, so um, I'm also, as in addition to being a storyteller, I'm also the son of an architect who became a city planner, um, first in Shreveport, Louisiana, and then here in Richmond, California. So. What was that? It's my hometown. You're from Shreveport? Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome. Let's talk about that later. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, so um, I, when Faye approached Bayvac uh, to get involved with the, the SFUFF in its first year, we're like, what is that? And I immediately kind of saw the connection between storytelling and planning and uh, community and civic engagement in creating more equitable and just cities. And I was like, I'm in whatever it is, whatever this crazy thing is, I'm in. And flash forward six years and I'm still with it. I'm excited that you're all with it and that you're here today. Um, just by a show of hands before we get into sort of storytelling basics, how many of you consider yourselves storytellers, story whether it's through a physical medium or just spoken word? One, two, kind of, I saw some half hands there. Um, so storytelling as we're framing it in these workshops is a very specific type of storytelling. It's about community communication, about urban planning, about, like I said, creating uh, more just, equitable cities for our future. Um, and so we're gonna be very targeted in our approach. And the structure that I'm going to show you, um, I actually learned from the Adobe Youth Voices program that I used to run for, in conjunction with Bayvac. It just makes storytelling, kind of demystifies storytelling quite a bit. And just boils it down to four very easy to digest pillars, story, audience, message, and style. So we're gonna take a dive through that. Um, but I wanted, before we get into it, start framing storytelling and how we're using it, how m you may be using it already and are, are not giving yourself credit for. So um, anybody here, I'm just going to speak from my personal experience, anybody here play Dungeons and Dragons? Past, present, future, yes. Um, I am a big old nerd. You can tell my dragon belt buckle, my D&D &D socks, right? Um, <laughs> I love playing Dungeons and Dragons because it is collaborative storytelling. If you've never played before, it's a bunch of people sitting around a table rolling dice, but that is just part of it. We are actively creating and uh, recreating a world together. Um, I spend eight hours a day working at Bay Area Video Coalition, but I never spend more than an hour or so actively collaborating with people. In D&D, you are like just last Friday night at my regular game. We are actively collaborating, reacting to one another, and t telling a shared narrative over four to five hours at a go, right? So there are other ways that I'm sure that you're using storytelling if you have children, right? We're constantly explaining the world through stories to them. Um, if you are sharing a recipe with someone, you're probably just giving, you know, you might be giving the steps, but you're also giving some backstory about how that recipe became part of your life, your, your family's culture, or what have you, right? So um, we all kind of have this connection. We are storytelling animals at our base. So I want you to connect with that today before we lay on this more clinical aspect of it, breaking things down. Because ultimately, in today's workshop, we're going to be talking about stories related to urban development topics or redevelopment topics. Um, and those stories kind of by their very nature need to have a specific call to action or something that we want to excite the audience about, something that we want people to engage with. So that's the kind of framing that we're going to use. Before we get going, does anybody have any questions? Okay.
So there are no expected outcomes. There is no homework for this first workshop other than you walk away from here having a better understanding of how you would craft a message using these four pillars, story, audience, message, and style. If we're all on board, then we can jump in. Okay, I'm gonna set this down. Hello, all right, cool. Um, so, welcome again. Um, we are going to be talking about using storytelling in transportation planning, um, but again, we're gonna be zoomed out at the 50,000 foot level, right? Thinking about um, storytelling in story, audience, message, and style. Um, so for the rest, or for the next little bit here, I'm gonna just be breaking down these four pillars for you, getting you th to think about them. And then I have two sample videos that I'd like you to watch and engage with and jot down your thoughts. I'll get some handouts out to you. I see a lot of people are jotting down the notes already. If you have, a, or if you need a pen or something to write with, let us know when we start passing out the handouts and we'll make sure that you get one. Um, or you can take notes digitally, whatever is best for you. So. Um, thinking about story, um, we're thinking about a sequence of events, right? First something happens, then something else happens or fails to happen, and that sets up the next event and the next event and the next event. So thinking about long form storytelling, filmmaking for example, feature filmmaking, those stories are typically predicated upon a rising conflict, right? So they're moving towards, everybody's seen classic three act structure, you remember from literature, right? We have sort of exposition at the beginning, we're sort of getting familiar with who the characters are, what their lives are like, and then there's some sort of inciting incident that takes us off on this beginning arc towards a moment of truth, a decision or a, an action that happens. Um, for shorter storytelling, that, that structure kind of falls apart, right? We don't have time to develop a rapport with a character necessarily. We have to use shorthand maybe to get there. So we have to be thinking about if we're doing bite-sized storytelling, how do we reframe? How do we still create some sort of conflict or, and resolution, some sort of tension in the story to really drive emotional engagement? Uh, but how do we do that quickly? Um, so there usually, like I said, is a central conflict. Um, I'll do this a little differently than I normally do it. Raise your hand if you have not seen Star Wars Episode Four, the very first Star Wars. Okay, there's always a couple. Um, for the rest of you, you probably know where that rising tension and that moment of truth are in that film. Um, warning for those of you who have not seen the film, there might be some spoilers. Um, it's been out for 40 years, so I mean. <laughs> so uh, anybody want to tell me what is the Act one, act two break, where we go from introducing our main cast of characters to the central conflict. You, just, you don't have to raise a hand, you can literally just shout it out. Nobody knows, everybody knows. As soon as I say it, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, of course. Um, so I'll ask it a different way. Um, what was holding Luke Skywalker back from pursuing his destiny? His aunt and uncle. Yes, he complained about that. I, you know, I, he wants, all of his friends are going off to the Starfighter Academy, and he's like, I want to go, but I have to stick around and help Uncle Ben, or not Uncle Ben, Uncle Owen and Aunt Veru, right? Um, and Deus Ex Machina, sorry for the spoiler, but those people get killed, and that obstacle for him pursuing his destiny is removed, and he is therefore inexorably whisked towards his destiny. Which is to do what? Where, where's the conflict resolved in that film? Saves the world. Saves the world, exactly how? The Death Star is blown up, right? Spoiler alert, Darth Vader does not die in the first film. He comes back many, many times. But the Death Star is destroyed, and in the sequel, a new one is built. But that is the central sort of source of the enemy's power in that film, and that is destroyed, resolution, denouement, as the French would call it, and we close out the film, roll credits, right? So there is this sort of rising tension, there is no alternative but for Luke to have this showdown with Darth Vader vis-a-vis -vis the Death Star, once that's resolved, end of movie, no, no reason for us to go on 
although they have gone on for another five movies, right? Is it five? Yes, something like that. Um, but that is, you can take that framework, that storytelling framework, that rising tension model, and overlay it to any of your favorite films, and there probably is a central conflict. So part of what we're doing today is sort of digging into those sort of underlying things that are there that you just accept, and hoping, hoping to help you become aware of them. A, so you can watch films and things more critically. Sorry, I'm gonna ruin your filmmaking experience forever. Um, but start watching things more critically and stealing all of the best things and using it in your own storytelling so that you can craft more effective, powerful stories. Make sense? Again, apologies for ruining every movie ever, but once you start seeing how the sausage is made, you can't unsee it, right? Um, so, in our storytelling, uh, we're gonna be stripping out what, what is the story, for, again, for short stories like the ones that we're gonna watch today, I think the longer of the two is about three and a half minutes long. Um, there may not be a central conflict, but there should be something that's easy for you to track in uh, an informational story like the one that we're going to see. There is, we start with this image or series of images. We move through this type of image. There's an element of sound that happens, blah, 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 right? There's an A to Z flow to even these short stories. Um, for those of you that are thinking about getting into filmmaking, um, you already have a really great filmmaking tool in your pocket. Um, so you don't have to go and start making stories that have an A to Z flow. I have a favorite activity, um, something I just did yesterday, um, which is called creating a sense of place video. Um, or it could, you could think of it as a visual poem, like a love letter to a place, where you're taking your camera and you're showing the audience, whoever that may be, sometimes it's just for your own personal satisfaction, sometimes it's for a, a wider consumption through social media and other outlets, um, where you're just walking your audience through a place and showing all of the details that you as a creative individual are seeing that other people might not notice. So for me, that was yesterday in Mere Woods. Whatever my eye captured, and the, there was in this little shallow grotto, there was this little mushroom that was different color contrast and different sort of texture and glistening and grabbed my eye and I got in there with my camera and shot that amongst, of course, the location-based shots kind of give us a sense of the scope and scale of the environment, um, but also these detail shots kind of show you what my, how my brain works, how my eye works. So be thinking about that. The, not all storytelling has to have a sort of linear narrative to it. It can just be, hey, let me walk you through my world, okay? Um, coming up next is audience. Um, when we're creating stories about social change, typically we have an audience or audiences in mind. Um, and sometimes that audience changes from the time that we start creating the piece to the time that we finish. Or maybe, uh, to put it more uh, directly, the audience for the finished product is not necessarily the audience that we're reaching out to at multiple touch points along the creation of the story. So, um, I'll give you a, a, a case in point. Um, I have been working in collaboration with my co-producer on a documentary film called Beyond the Gap for the last six years. So as long as I've been involved with SFUFF, I've been working on this documentary film. Off and on in our spare time, self-funded. Um, this film is about the achievement gap and three young African-American men who graduated from George Washington High School who beat the odds and, and uh, went beyond uh, the achievement gap and are actually very successful and have important stories to share to the folks coming up after them about how to achieve graduation and success later on in life. So we started off thinking about this film, the product, as being for folks who are typically at risk of falling into the achievement gap, not completing high school, not having uh, educational success or financial success beyond high school. That's who the film is for. But we have multiple different audiences for that film product or project along the way. So at our fundraising stage, high school kids for whom this film is being made are not the ones with the deep pockets that we're going to be reaching out to, right? So in crafting our marketing for fundraising, we're reaching out to folks that are super, super keen on solving the achievement gap. Who are those folks? Let's shout it out. Parents. Parents. Do pa school boards. Parents, do parents of 
folks in, uh, at risk of falling into the achievement gap have deep pockets? By definition, probably not, right? Foundation. School boards, foundations, educational reform agencies. Um, one of the big target audiences that we are looking at, um, and I've been emailing, trying to get in front of them for the last two years, the California Teachers Association. We want to go and present at their conference, which is on uh, social justice and equity. Like, that's a great place to go preaching to the choir, getting folks fired up, and having them reach out to their networks for us because we don't know all the people that they know, right? That's audience, thinking about audience, thinking about who they are and how that audience can change over time. So for your pieces today, for those of you that are going on to level two, um, I'm actually gonna encourage you to think about audience first, but that acronym AMSS doesn't roll off the tongue the way that SAMS does, right? So story, audience, message, and style makes a lot, a lot of sense. It's easy to remember, but audience is probably the first thing that we should be thinking about in level two, just pre-populating that for those of you that are coming along with us for the rest of the ride. Um, so when we're thinking about the audience, um, we're thinking about who needs to experience this story. And especially nowadays, where we're consuming video content both on big screens, medium screens, and small screens, we need to think about where they will be when they interact with that story. Because that audience, both demographically, the things that are happening off the screen, what those experiences are that that audience is bringing to your project, um, matters at least as much, if, if not uh, in equal amount or a little, slightly a little bit more, what matters is where they're consuming that story. Right? If it's on a mobile device, that is a creative constraint in terms of what we can do visually, how we design the frames. If it's for a big screen, for a, if, uh, for a feature film, that sort of thing, we have a different frame that we can put things in and we can do different things. For our social media savvy folks, we might be breaking a cardinal rule for me as a filmmaker of shooting things vertically. Right, to make more usage of this screen for our audience that can't be troubled to turn their phone sideways to watch this beautiful 16 by nine world that we've created. Right? So just thinking about who that audience is and how they're consuming stories gives us a sense of both sort of framing the story itself, but f literal framing how we're putting things on the screen. Um, now we come to message. Message is different than story. So story is the A to Z thing, right? First this thing happened, then this thing failed to happen, which precipitated a reaction, uh, either positive or negative. Um, a message in this context could be a takeaway, a moral, or probably more closely true for the types of stories that we're creating, a call to action. So uh, with civic engagement videos, a lot of it's going to be take this survey or register to vote or fill in the blank, some specific action. We want to be as clear as possible about what that next step is if we want that engagement. And um, I teach a class at Bayback on uh, video for social media, and I encourage people to think beyond, you know, the typical sign off for most YouTube videos, you know, like, subscribe, blah, 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 right? Unless you have some long-term goal, those likes and subscribes won't do you any good. And for our purposes and trying, trying to change the course of history, we need engagement, not just passive, I like this, I want to see more of this. We want specific actions that that uh, audience is taking. So bringing it back and sort of delineating between story and message, uh, were there any themes or messages from Star Wars Episode Four? I know, I told you, I warned you, I'm a big old nerd, right? Uh, any themes or messages from Star Wars Episode Four that you can think of? Not the this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But what was the more? What are some morals or messages buried in that story? Yes. I was thinking about like good and evil, like good will prevail, not because it's like the stronger force, because there's more heart, like something along the, those lines. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I like to take away from Star Wars. <laughs> there are a lot of. Uh, stories that have that at their core, right? The triumph of good, triumph of good over evil. But you picked up on something really important, which is um, good doesn't triumph over evil because it's more powerful or larger in number, but because it's good by its very nature of being right, it triumphs despite the odds, right? So, uh, what else? What are some other themes, takeaways? 
There's multiples there, and there's no wrong answer. Interconnection of all things. Yeah, I love that one, right? So the force is this very sort of interconnected thing, very, um, oh, I hesitate to use the word, but very Buddhist sort of thinking, like we're all connected to even the unliving things in the world, right? There's this force, there's this web that connects us all, right? Anything else? Resiliency and persistence, absolutely, right? Um, just even in the tragedy of Luke's adoptive parents being taken away from him, it, because he digs deep, he connects to this force, he's able to become a hero, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. The importance of forming alliances. Nice, I love that you wove the word alliance in there as well, again, big nerd. Um, yes, uh, you know, pulling together teams, pulling together people from different walks of life, different planets in this uh, space opera that is Star Wars, right? Um, different cultures, different languages, coming together to do what is right together in, in alliance. Absolutely. Nice, well done. Um, so these themes and, and messages are not unique to Star Wars. They're just, they were presented on screen in a novel way for the first time in that film, right? They've been presented through, throughout storytelling. This, the central theme of good triumphing over evil is kind of why we're all here today, right? How we're still alive because it's kind of easier to be evil sometimes, right? To be self-centered and to only focus about the now and the moment, right? But there's gotta be something beyond just immediate satisfaction. There's this idea of a greater good, and that's literally a story that's as old as time, right? Um, so, great, you're getting it, right? The themes. Um, there wasn't a specific call to action or takeaway from a movie like that, but we're going to craft in this afternoon session a specific takeaway, and I'm gonna ask you to look at the pieces uh, we're gonna take a look at in just a little bit um, for those takeaways, what those thoughts uh, are are that they want you, or the actions that the, the creators are trying to get you to take away. Lastly, style. Um, style is as varied as all of us in the room. We're gonna have a different style in the way that we present stories based on our collected or individual experience. Um, but again, I think looking at your audience and not just giving them a style that is most resonant with you, but a style that you have done your homework on and is most resonant with them. Right? So if we're speaking, especially if we're speaking to people who are uh, not like us, we want to package those messages in a style that are going to be digestible to them because we've done our empathy homework and figured out these are the types of stories uh, and, and the styles that resonate. So for me, for example, I package my teaching in a different way for adult learners like yourselves than I do for younger people, right? Um, I have a different I don't dress like this when I work with young people, right? I wear t-shirts and jeans and I, you know, uh, et, et cetera. So packaging style is, uh, is a big piece of it. We're gonna look at that. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to analyze these, these couple of pieces and think about what their styles are. Um, one thing that will determine or that is a part of stylistic choice uh, is the tone. So um, I'm imagining Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm imagining you are all fairly worldly and fairly informed about what's going on in the world right now. Um, and you probably get your news and information from a variety of different sources. There's sort of this editorial tone that uh, most news outlets will have, but I will make it simple. Some of us get our news from NPR and some of us get our news from The Daily Show. Completely different packaging and style for the same sort of headline news, right? The same story packaged differently for different audiences. So thinking about how your audience is consuming stories, getting information, what's gonna motivate them, resonate with them. If we do doom and gloom, that works for a certain subset of our audience. If we do humor, that works for a different subset of our audience, right? So really thinking about how we're gonna package the information, how we're gonna, again, stimulate, tug at the heartstrings, maybe make people cry a little bit, that opens up wallets sometimes, make people laugh, make people angry. What are we trying to do? That's all stylistic choice, yes.
No, no, it's a great question and it's a perennial question and there is no easy answer to it. What I would say probably would be better addressed or better described by someone with a strong marketing background, but I would say this falls into the category of segmentation. So we have the same information, but we may need to package it multiple different ways for those different subsets of our audience. There are things that are intended for general consumption, but I from what I have seen, especially in the world of planning, that planning communication that is broad, ooh, sorry, uh, very broad tends to fall flat because it's so vanilla and so broad. Doesn't motivate me personally, doesn't feel like it's speaking to me personally um, because it's trying to suit everybody, right? So that's something in a, in a style or a pre-production type of uh, meeting that comes up pretty often. I do see the hand, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, it comes up quite often. We have different target demographics that we're trying to reach and maybe we have to come up with different styles, uh, multiple different deliverables for this one project in order to resonate with these different populations. Yes. that still feel authentic and earnest and not pandering or tokenist? Yes, thank you for that. Um, that is a deep conversation and it's an ongoing one and it's something that I'm very excited to be involved with an organization like BayVac um, because at its core, the organization exists to empower storytelling from different vantages. So. Um, as a result of being with an organization like that, I know that there are some stories that I'm not qualified to tell, right? And that's part of that empathy homework, right? I don't, I don't want someone telling my story without my input. So similarly, if I were to tell a story for an audience that I don't have direct interaction with, I would try to, and again, avoiding that tokenist, like, oh, I know this person that fits this demographic, let me put you on the spot and have you be a, a representative for your, for your entire race or gender identity or whatever, right? We need to form alliances, right? And, and figure out from that group think, that group mind, like what are the things that this audience cares about? Not just how do I, mm, I'm gonna just go ahead and say it, how do I manipulate this audience into the action that I want, right? Um, so, this is a little bit different, I'm gonna, sh because the question is there and I wanna address it as best as I can. Um, one of the first nonprofit jobs that I had was teaching entrepreneurship to uh, middle school and high school students in, um, in San Francisco and, and uh, Oakland. And um, I'm gonna just get dis distill it down as best as I can to like the core takeaway from that. Um, the founder of that organization founded the organization because he had volunteered for the Peace Corps. And when he was over in Kenya, I believe it was either Kenya or Tanzania, it was his, his first assignment. Um, they, the, they being the Peace Corps came over and were like, we're gonna do this infrastructure project for you. Um, and, um, or sorry, we're gonna do some project that we came ready to do. And the people in the village were like, we actually just need running water because we can handle the education piece. We can build our own school. We need clean water. And they're like, no, no, no. We're going to take care of the school part of it for you because that's what's most important, right? So not listening to the community, but instead telling them what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and I think that's kind of what resonated with me with SFUFF and the, the potential of SFUFF in the beginning is hopefully getting planners and constituents together and collaboratively storytelling and weaving a narrative about what the future can be like as opposed to it just being this sort of top-down information. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Cool. It's always a tricky situation to yeah, keep communities like, far, like at the forefront of telling their stories. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. workshops like this, workshops like are conducted at Bayback and at other places around the Bay Area that put the tools of communication in folks' hands who have not had them to, like, I held up my phone earlier, like, this, is, if you don't understand how radical a shift this is, like, there's, 
it's, it's amazing. Like the barriers to visual storytelling have all but been completely removed. So now the question is how do we, and that's why we're all here, right? How do we tell better stories so that they rise above the chatter and the, the baseline noise, which as more people are able to tell stories, the baseline noise has increased. So we have to be able to stand out against that background noise. Cool, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, so one of the things that we have to think about uh, or we should be talking about when we're thinking about style are the constraints of budget, skill set, and commitment, which I call the three T's, talent, tools, and time. Right? So what are the, the constraints imposed by what we have at the table? If we are a government agency or a community-based organization whose sole or core mission doesn't involve visual storytelling, it's pretty likely, at least in my limited experience, that we're lacking on at least two, if not three of the T's. One of them that we're probably lacking on, whether we're professionals at this or not, is always time. Sometimes we have a lot of tools and we have a lot of talent, but we don't have a lot of time. And this is where some of those shortcuts get made. And I, I want to thank you for bringing that up again. These shortcuts get made because we've got to get something out right now because there's a policy decision that needs, we need input on. So rather than doing that deep dive and doing that, I'm going to just run with it. I just came up with it in the moment, that empathy homework, right? Like rather than doing that, we wind up bulldozing over that in, term, in, in the uh, interest of finishing the thing on the deadline, right? Um, and that usually means that our visual stories don't have the type of impact or are not as representative that they should be and we don't get the results that we're looking for. Um, so, like I said, we have small budget devices that we can use if we learn how to use them well. There's a wealth of information on the internet. The University of YouTube has all the information that you need about how to turn your smartphone into a better video making tool. Um, or you can come learn it from me at Bayback. Your choice. Um, but quality is a component of style that I want to sort of drill into. So production value is one thing that people um, will ding a video on. They'll turn it off in the fir first five seconds if it looks too amateur. Unless, again, we've done a deep dive or we've done a lot of thinking about our audience and like this is going to be funny for this audience because it looks so bad. Um, we actually, in the second uh, workshop, if you haven't heard already, uh, we're going to tear apart something that was shot poorly uh, by our friends at SFCTA and try to make it better. So we'll have some opportunity to talk about quality, production value, style things with them and utilize that in our conversation of how we make a better video. Um, so that's a, that's a first for this group, which is awesome. Um, but sometimes, just to put a fine point on it, sometimes things that look too slick and polished don't land well with the intended audience. It feels less than authentic because it feels like you hired a PR company to come and tell this story as opposed to it being from the people, for the people, by the people. Right? So sometimes a DIY or quote unquote low quality uh, video is what we want or need in a particular situation. That's it. My work is done here. Right? <laughs> 40 minutes and we knocked it out. Um, no. Um, so what I want to um, actually take a look at now and give you some time to do are two uh, videos. Uh, one is, both of them uh, regard uh, public transit um, and they both center on LA. So we chose these pieces because they contrast with one another, not to like give too much away about uh, what you're, you're expected to see in just a moment. Um, but I want you to uh, watch them both, take notes if you need to, and I'll hand out these handouts. Thank you, Faye. I'm going to take like half. I'll okay. take out. So if you'll take one and pass it to your neighbor. Um, on these sheets are some categories for story, audience, message, and style, as well as some uh, sort of discussion prompts, things for you to look at um, or to be looking for. If anybody wants to use this uh, tool with their uh, audiences, with their teams, I can get this to you uh, digitally if you, if you need. Um, it's copyright 2010 or something like that from Adobe Youth Voices, which 
was an amazing program. It's no longer around, but it still lives very deeply in my heart. It's a lot of fun. Um, and there's tons of curriculum if you want to work with young people on storytelling that's available for free through the Adobe Education Exchange. Ten years of curriculum development um, for the Adobe Youth Voices program is available for free if you're interested. Um, again, just grab me at the break or after the second session, and I can give you that information. So uh, like I said, we've got two videos to tee up. And the first one, there we go. Peek into my nerdiness, like things are numbered, oh, all stuff. Organizational super freak is the title that I take. Um, so the first one, like I said, I'm just gonna, it's about three and a half minutes long. I'm just gonna let it run. Um, jot down as many thoughts as you can, just using those big picture things. What is the story? Who is the intended audience? What's the message? And what's the style? It's all subjective. There are no wrong answers, OK? And we'll ask you to share this out uh, popcorn style at the end after we've watched both and taken notes on both. Can you start yes, uh, Noah standing at the ready to do that. Yep. Cool. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> right? <laughs> So take a couple of minutes, uh, three minutes, jot down any thoughts on this piece. Um, anything you can see as far as story, audience, message, and style, what's the same? What's different between these two pieces? So we have uh, enough time to do a thorough discussion, debrief, and Q&A &A session. Um, so what I'd like to do is just go around the room and just talk about story first. So keep your thoughts, questions, comments to story first, and then we'll move through audience message and style as we go. Um, so um, please, when you give out a comment, just say, oh, this is re in regard to the first video or to the second video or to both, right? Um, so that we have that proper framework. Um, we don't have to ask those clarifying questions. So I'll just start with a question. Um, how did these two videos differ in their storytelling and the narrative A to Z? I think the second one was more of a quick snap into your life. Um, and then the first one was more just project detail information and just getting out there and explaining what, what it was they were doing. Second one, but um, it it maybe to me it turned me off a little bit <laughs> um, because it was that way. It's like, well, I'm not that. I'm not. That's not me as a commuter. And the I, second one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I, I think that's what they wanted wanted to do is make you sort of feel like you're in the shoes of the people that were they were showing. Okay. So. So I hand here and then here. Um, well-intentioned planners describing planning process and a lot of steps and a lot of jargon and um, trying to give you like a progress update on a very big complex project um, but not not reaching a general audience you know making a lot of the mistakes that um, agencies make when they use jargon and such the second one I thought they focused on you know, the first one was, here is transportation, and the second one was, here's what transportation allows you to do. Mm. And I felt that they were trying to get at, like, we'll, we'll make riding the bus really nice so that you can do what you want to do. And uh, they were younger, they were more inclusive, um, and l there were more people who were likely to ride a bus in those photos than maybe um, older commuters who were, you know, stuck with their habits. So I thought they tried to be more inclusive, but there were still some people they left out. I want to drill into that when we get back to message, because the, the messaging of those two videos was very different. We had a comment or question here, and then we'll come to you. I would just add in regards to story, um, I think the first one was really had a really explicit timeline where it, it actually painted the picture of the timeline on the screen right. and walked you through it step by step in a pretty 
boring way. <laughs> um, the second one was much more of an imp implicit timeline where it sort of painted a vision and used language like, we're laying tracks. It's not, it's not well, we did this alternatives analysis and that led us to these options and mm -hmm. someday we might lay tracks. Um, <laughs> so it was much more insp inspiring to me to sort of feel a part of a vision that had a sense of story underneath it than to have that laid out directly in front okay. of me. Okay, cool. Um, I might have missed the introduction as to how these videos were supposed to be consumed or like what communities they were consumed for, so I just assumed some things. So it seemed like the first one was um, explicitly targeting a smaller community, and so I, I didn't necessarily get the feeling that it was incorrect with its message or its story. It might have been correct for who it was talking to. Um, I'm not as familiar with LA, but it seemed like a relatively uh, affluent part of the city and um, they explicitly said they wanted to make it, well, I interpreted that they said they wanted to make it easier to get to your favorite locations in this area. So it wasn't necessarily about, to me it wasn't necessarily about um, making a huge change, it was iterative and they wanted to gain trust, uh, in my opinion, that they had listened to the community repeatedly. And so I, I, th I found that they were really trying to ex explicitly say trust us, like we've talked to people, these are the solutions you guys have provided, um, and so I found that from the first one. The second one was more of almost like a mental model saying, we're laying this seed in your head. And so later on, we might come back with different stories, maybe something more specific like that, the first one. Um, but for now, just um, maybe think differently than you had before. Change the way you've been thinking about transit in LA so that later on, we might give you some other stories that are more specific, so. Okay. We had comment here and then here. And then I think we'll take these two last story comments and then we'll move on to audience because we've already kind of touched on that a little bit unless there was a, another third burning question comment about story. Okay, perfect. So, take it away. so for me, the, you know, the bottom line story of this is about change and changing your lives. And both of them are trying to do the same thing but using very different techniques to do that. And I feel like probably a very similar audience as well. Who I don't really know that, but um, uh, what of course is fascinating, I mean, I'm not gonna repeat what good the other people have mentioned because they've made some really good points. Uh, you get right into why even, like, why would you even want to change immediately in the second, like you want to go there, you want to be part of that new lifestyle, you want to be, like there's a reason, deep reason why you want this change. They get you at the sort of guttural kind of emotional level that the first one doesn't even touch, okay. I don't think. So I, I thought it was a great uh, story in contrast of, you know, really the same problem and how you, you know, message it okay. differently. Uh, this uh, lady right here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so kind of how I thought about them was the first video was all about process. And then the second video to me was about a feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it, but I really think that the difference between the two of them for me was um, the first video kind of told you had a lot of different things that it was trying to tell you, you know, like um, it was telling you about the project, it was telling you about what happens at each state of the each step of the process, what were the results of some of those steps, um, whereas the second video really I think focused more so on one message, which was like this is a change and this is what we're focused this is what we want to see happen like are you in okay. And yeah, that's that was my main takeaway from watching these uh, these two back to back for the first time. Um, and someone touched on this. I just want to just drill into it. The first video was this is already happening or has happened, and this is how we got here, right? And so uh, you mentioned like we've we've listened to feedback along the way. 
trust us. I love that you put that in there. Just trust us. We've talked to we've talked to the people, but we never explicitly got a statement of a problem that the community brought. There was one problem or like a suggestion of expanding the bus service on Colorado Boulevard. What does that mean though? And who was the person or group that brought that to the to the puzzle? There, I'm sure, as you probably are all aware, doing policy work, like when you start trying to do change, you get people coming out of the woodworks of all the problems with the, the proposed change, right? And there wasn't an explicit statement of that, but it is sort of, to me, it felt like I've been here before and as a result of having seen that story so many times, I felt like this is us sort of after the fact justifying what, how we got here. So we did, we did our listening sessions. We did, we, we're clear about there was a process. If you didn't engage in the process, sorry, it's over. This is the change that is best for you. And this is why we, we know that. Now, I mean, I'm sure that was not the intent, but that's what I, you know, as a consumer, as an audience member, walked away with, right? Based on what I'm bringing to the story, not what they're presenting on screen. So it goes into audience, which we're gonna talk about next. The second piece, uh, the shorter piece, was more about, and people have touched on this, be a part of the change. Right, um, there is a specific call to action to get engaged, and there were some signs of things still being under construction. And it was explicitly stated, like we're we're laying tracks. Like there's still an opportunity for your voice to have an impact on how this change rolls out, as opposed to the other, the first one, which was more case closed. This is all coming. Right? That was my major takeaway or difference in story is the time frame at which we're engaging the audience. Does that make sense? So um, let's talk about audience. Uh, it was mentioned that they probably have the similar similar uh, audiences. We have a comment back here that uh, begs to differ. <laughs> Very different audience. I'd say that the audience for the first was for the folks who live along the corridor between Pasadena, Burbank, Eagle Rock, and, and that particular area. Um, I would say the audience for the second one was the entire LA basin. Um, and they had completely different purpose. One was, hey, we decided we're doing BRT and we're, we're proving to you that we're doing the necessary public input and come along with us. And the second one is, hey, um, change is necessary, embrace the change because the cool kids are doing it. <laughs> so. Nice. Yeah, I think uh, in, the, in the first one, there wasn't an explicit statement of the problem necessarily that was being solved by the, the new changes, whereas there were some explicit things in the, um, in the second piece that spoke to audience concerns. Uh, cleaner buses, free Wi-Fi, these are things to get people to use it as opposed to just sort of this is how it's been constructed. Where's the microphone now? Right there. Thank you. Yeah, I might argue that the second one, the audience may have been policymakers, legislators, their metropolitan transportation commissions, um, and the higher level, they're trying to frame it as if it's like a massive movement toward transit, but those are the people that control the purse strings. And they might want, you know, with a higher level aspirational change motif, that's who they might be appealing to, but I don't know. Interesting, okay. I actually had a very similar reaction to the first video, um, that that might actually be to the municipal governments along that area because the language was so jargony and technically heavy. And as a transportation planner, I still felt like I had to really focus to catch all the steps. And this is what I do, you know? <laughs> so I think um, to me, it might've been trying to explain to the cities along the way why they were doing this. Or, you know, it's, it was very informational and what if we, tease that apart, maybe part of the information that's being imparted is talking points for those government officials to be like, no, all this, you know, to the constituents that are coming in their door, no, all the boxes were ticked along the process, and this is why it's going to be good. Yeah, I like that. Um, my read on the audience for the second one uh, was just because I'm a millennial, and I felt like it was trying to speak to me. Um, it was like, like you said, like, this is what the cool kids are doing, um, transition millennials in LA away from car culture towards transit culture, hmm. which... Um, 
I felt it was very heavy handed. Um, and I also thought that it could be alienating for someone who's not like a hip young person. Um, and like, especially if we consider who uses transit mostly um, and that they were not represented in that film. So. Nice. I have a question. Sure. Um, so in the, the first video, especially, they talked about, they, they used the word community. And here you are in LA, and it's so diverse. So what, like, how do you talk about the people you included without using this generic term that sometimes community is, um, doesn't include everyone, it's those who, part, those who know process and participate. So any, any advice on responding to that? Um. I don't have a specific example, but what I felt was lacking in that first piece that helps maybe get to that is just B-roll of some of those community events. We actually show who was present contributing the ideas. And there's an accountability piece there, right? If we're not engaging with a diverse audience, if all of our audiences that are giving feedback look and feel the same, that's on us as designers of a solution that's meant to fit you know, a, a more diverse population. Um, and that's something that just by using visual storytelling, by documenting those events, we can check our own work and say, wow, our audiences all look the same. How are we, you know, we're getting data back, but we're falling down on getting data from more people, right? I think this might kind of be a bridge between audience and message, but on the same line, um, this idea of vulnerability and showing vulnerability in these videos, especially for public agencies, I think is pretty hard um, when you're doing these huge, big public change projects, but this is something that I thought was lacking in that first message to that particular audience or for people who are outside of that audience was like, you know, the, I don't know, I felt like there was this missing storyline. They're like, there's comments on this and comments on this and like comments on density and comment. And it was like, there's obviously a bigger story here that if you kind of put real specifics on like, some members of the community are, are scared that there's going to be change that, you know, X, Y, and Z, or some members are scared that they're gonna be left out for X, Y, and Z reasons. And I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think in these types of, like the first video in particular, it felt like, uh, yeah, not, not super genuine, but for the same reasons that like the second video didn't feel super genuine, was like, yeah, it felt this like very, uh, like there were stories there that were left out. I don't know, just like this idea of vulnerability in storytelling, I think is a really big one that I'm finding difficult uh, to see in a lot of storytelling and a lot of like messaging for these big projects um, that for me misses the mark a lot of times. And I think uh, public agencies are really scared to like, I don't know, be vulnerable, which I understand. I work for a public agency, but yeah, it's tough. Yeah. It is very scary to be in a position where you're supposed to have all the answers to admit that you don't. Um, one of the, mo like, this is related to this, but we're, I, think, I feel like we're in a transitional period with the uh, integration of visual storytelling, of social, like, you know, agencies being on social media. We're in this very interesting transitional period. And one of the things that I can just share with you from my own vulnerability and sort of experience, when I first started teaching, um, one of the most important tips that I got was, you do not have all the answers, so stop pretending that you do and stop feeling bad about not having all the answers. Enter into when someone questions you, like, why is this working and you don't have an answer, go, that's a great question. Let's figure it out together, as opposed to, don't ask me that, right? Like, why are you asking me that? Um, which is, a, you know, I have definitely had old school teachers that are like, precocious little brat, stop asking questions. I'm here to give you the information, not to answer your questions, right? So um, that's hard to do as a, as a government agency. I understand with a lot of moving pieces, it's not just one person. But if we can sort of 
uh, one of the things that attracted me to this, this uh, project, this ex grand experiment that Faye has been on for the last six years, was this idea that we want to get those government agencies beyond presenting information in a PowerPoint in this one-way direction and start get, you know, empowering communities to tell story with video, to share with agencies, to share with one another. Um, I feel like I went on a little bit of a, of a rant there, but like the, the idea of being vulnerable and being open to not having all the answers and being willing to collaborate is super, super important to me personally. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you implement that in or, at an organizational or agency-based level, Huge, but, but right, uh, yeah. We're doing it, and level two, SFCTA, really, they are really taking a risk coming here, asking the participants to help them message the congestion pricing study much more effectively than they, than they are doing. So they are really trying to be open and being vulnerable for input. Now, the input is coming from planners, but it, you know, one step towards getting input from uh, folks out in the community, and Keith and I are actually working with young community developers in the Bayview, and we're testing out the storytelling workshop uh, with the folks at Young Community Developers, and they're inviting the elders from the Bayview to speak about their desires to see more home ownership in the Bayview uh, as part of their 100 Black homeowner, uh, homeowner project. So using the storytelling workshop, we're not the ones giving the story. The stories are coming up, bubbling up from the community. Um, and yes, they're a nonprofit community-based organization, but I feel like we can move from there towards uh, do, doing this process with, with more public agencies. Yeah, and I think just to piggyback on that, um, SFCTA was our partner for this level two workshop last year, um, and they wanted help in creating um, a call to action for the autonomous vehicle, uh, the autonomous shuttle on Treasure Island, which in our conference calling prepping, prepping for this meeting, we we're like, so whatever happened to that? And they're like, uh, it's not happening anytime soon. So like, at least they're open, like they're an agency that's open to sharing things and getting ideas of getting feedback or you know, getting feedback on a process even when that thing didn't even come to fruition, right? And I think that level of vulnerability of just showing things before it's finished and, and really trying to reach people and get their, their spirit of trying to get deeper engagement along the pre-production phase of things um, is definitely welcome, yes. Yeah, um, I also probably am transitioning a little bit into messaging as well, but okay. one yeah. thing that I was um, thinking about from the audience standpoint is the first one, um, it definitely felt like there was a, like an accountability aspect to it, and, and like maybe it's for a taxpayer, maybe for um, like a government, but it was, it was um, yeah, very much like trying to showcase that like it's a like status report-esque or wanted to make sure that like they are showing that they're doing something. Uh, and the second, I actually thought the audience was more so, and um, I actually just moved from LA and actually worked for LA, or interned with LA Metro. Okay. Um, and uh, one thing that I noticed, especially like, I was a student at UCLA and the West Side is a lot of people that never use transit. Um, and one thing that I was thinking, this was trying to be directed to, was people who don't take transit today, and especially like the young millennial that doesn't take transit and so inspiring them especially to like allow them to see how they can capture more of like their time across LA um, versus staying in like our five mile radius bubble that most people do um, okay. living in one neighborhood. Cool, cool, cool. So um, yeah, that we have a couple of interesting uh, transition points. I'll pay you both for your segues later on. Um, but let's talk about uh, message. What were some messages in piece one and piece two that we have not yet touched upon? What were some calls to action? Were, or were there specific calls to action in either piece? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have a quick one on the story and audience. OK. Uh, the first one, uh, someone was just like reading tweets like, why not get that person to come and tell us what they think of the program, you know? And this is a, a, a audience kind of telling your story or the story that the agency wants to tell. Have your audience actually participate and tell that story. First of all, it just makes it authentic right off the bat. You don't get a boring talking head. You get someone else that's part of the community. And this kind of relates to the second one, and it might just be an L.A. thing. 
Like, don't get voiceover actors to, to read a narrative. <laughs> like, get people in the community and show their faces. Um, it's just something that, to think about and throw that out there. Yeah, definitely. That's the, the second piece that you mentioned is on, on the style tip. And I definitely want to drill into that because they I think they both got points and dings on style, given the audiences that we're trying to reach. Um, what are some other like messaging things? What, what, the question that I left sort of dangling was, was there a specific call to action? Was there something that the filmmakers were asking you to do in either piece, here and then here? Join the movement. Join the movement, it was a second one, absolutely. Yeah, it was explicitly stated. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's much more of a mandate in the second one, even though you could argue that some of it was a bit artificial. Um, but you know, this is your city. You're, it's up to you, as opposed to the first one, which was much more of a re like reporting. It felt like we. It was almost not defensive, but it was kind of in that camp a little bit more. Like here's all the great things we're already doing because of you, as opposed to come on, get out here. That was much more clear in the second. Okay. I would even say the second didn't go far enough in a call to action. It was this generic join the movement. But there wasn't like a go to this website, do this thing, be involved in the public process. Um, you know, if I want to join the movement, tell me how. If, if I'm if I'm riding the bus, am I on the movement already? <laughs> Is there something else I need to do to do the movement? Um, I just found it like oh good. I don't know. It was like very pat on the back, but not a like. And how do we do the movement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I I agree that there was, um, so the first one had like a very specific, like here's our, our handles, like come see, you know, what's going on next. And the second one was definitely more like buy into this movement. But I also had this feeling that the second video was kind of just like buy into this general movement. But when you hear about like, there's this measure that's going to, you know, fund transportation projects throughout our city. Like, that's when you have this, like, thing that has been instilled in you subconsciously of, like, I want to support this because it's going to get me to clean buses and, uh, you know, funding for Wi-Fi. Like, that, I, I felt like it was more of a subconscious thing. Like, when you hear about transportation, it's good. Like, public <laughs> transportation is good. Choose that over writing, you know, Uber or so on and so forth. I said a couple more questions and then we'll come over here. So I'll, I'll start by saying I don't have a background in transportation or, or any of this. So for me, the second one, I was like, oh, okay, this makes total sense and nothing is good or bad except by comparison. I was trying to write down all the call to action in the first one and I had six calls to action. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult to watch. And I, I don't know jargon or any of that. So I was like, uh, like, what do you do with this information? And then the second one, to me, I actually liked. Because I felt, as you know, someone who's been in the Bay Area for a while and not knowing LA at all, it was easy to understand what needed to happen. So it felt very commuter-centric and successful in that regard. So to me, I, I thought it was actually quite good. Um, but, but super confusing, the first one. And then the more I hear everyone else talk about it, you see why, like you could have broken the first one into certain, a whole bunch of different pieces and made a whole bunch of shorts that are really helpful and there's like clear calls to action. So I think that was the biggest piece that was hard for, for me to consume and really understand what the, what the uh, gist was. And then I think what you were saying with like the Wi-Fi and, and certain things that really stuck out that was like, yeah, I wanna get on that, that makes sense. <laughs> and I think for, for me, it was very emotional and the second one was really great in that regard. Mm -hmm. We have some thoughts over here. This gentleman's been waiting for a minute, but. <clears throat> right, right down front. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like the, the first one didn't have a, I, I agree with the critique of the second that it didn't necessarily have a concrete takeaway, even though the takeaway or the ask might have been more of buying into this vision or these values that we talked about. Um, the first, on the other hand, I felt like kind of ended on the any questions question mark slide that you know everybody's told <laughs> not to do on a presentation. Um, it's like this is a list of all these things, but they didn't say where to go. It's a confusing you know handle that you can't remember, and they don't tell you exactly why you should even be going to that website in the first place, and you probably don't know what EIR means. Um, whereas the second one um, is kind of showing the human scale 
of transportation and mobility around LA. It really focuses on the people, um, which I ad appreciate and personally buy into and resonates with me. Do I see a hand back here? Or, and then we'll, we'll switch over to style. Is that good? I'm just being very conscious of the time. Because I want to save some time at the end for us to uh, ask questions so we can copy and steal everything that worked, right? The case school of content creation. Copy and steal everything so that we can start telling better stories ourselves. So for those of you that are going on to the second uh, workshop, um, definitely bring that to the table with you. For those of you that are going to go out and enjoy the rest of your day, at least you can take that little piece with you. So thank you. Well, I think the message had a lot to do with what the purpose was. And so on the first one, the purpose was like adding voice and audio to what you would normally find on a website, which is a sheet of paper that tells you, here's the process, this is what we're doing, we're checking all the boxes, et cetera. But this gave it you know, an animated mapping, some video, some, some visual interest. And you got to see the faces behind the, the technocrats, you know, who are the technocrats doing this. The second one was a branding piece. It was all about, this is the new LA Metro. We are cool. <laughs> and it was all about, you know, we're not just that clunky bus that's going down the Wilshire Boulevard. We're all about all of this new great stuff. Jump on board. Yeah. Um, Just one thing though, neither one of them, unless I missed something, had that, and maybe somebody already said this, but that piece that you hang on to that says, you know, okay, join the movement, how, where, where do I show up, what do I sign, what's that, and that's how I know I would want to use a piece like this, is to look into an action. So I want to dissect that because a couple of people have brought that up, but we'll do it in the style section. So there was another comment over here somewhere. If it relates to message, we'll get it in. But uh, the style piece of it, I think, gets at that call to action piece. I just want to add one more sentence to uh, everything else we heard. <laughs> I think that the um, first one had, as someone said, more like a checkbox on that we were diverse in our messages and sending messages across the board and receiving diverse messages. But the second one was um, like the difference between diversity and inclusiveness to, in, to invite everyone to take participate and feel they are a part of the bigger picture story. Okay, cool. So um, just high level, um, if you had to put these two videos into stylistic categories, um, what comes to mind? What, what sort of adjectives come to mind? Bureaucratic, Bureaucratic for the first one? Linear. Linear for both? One. For the first one, okay. I would say in informational for the first one. Okay. For the second one. Okay. First one was in-house. Okay. I actually got the, I felt that they were both done with outside agencies. That's a fairly safe assumption, yes. Um, the videography in both of them, when they did use uh, B-roll of the city, was clearly professionally done, whether it was, it was commissioned for the, the first piece or if it was just done through stock, they paid good money for those images. In the, exactly. It's, not to stereotype any of the planners in the room, that's probably not a skill set that we have in our departments for, you know, for a CTA or, um, that's why you come to Bayback. You learn all that stuff and then you take it back. But um, yeah, I think there were, there were outside talents being utilized, leveraged um, to, to make these things both from a stylistic, you know, keeping it, the conversation in style, very professional and polished look as opposed to, hey, I'm your friendly neighborhood agency member and I just made this video for social media, right? They're definitely um, high style. Um, so somebody said about the first one, informational. The second one uh, was more uh, hip was one, one term that was used. Cool was used a couple of times. Um, I would say that that second piece was, does not have a call to action for a reason because it was shot and created as a commercial or a branding piece, right? So. Um, Unless someone is having a sale for something, there's usually in a commercial, there's not a call to action, 
right? Um, or you know, maybe it's your local appliance store and they're saying like, call us or go to our website to get more information essentially. But um, when was the last time you saw like insert your favorite brand, Cheetos, Coca-Cola, where it was like, here's a specific call to action. Probably not, right? There might even be a story that has nothing to do with the brand. The whole purpose of that video is to burn that brand into your brain because it was funny, it was cool, it was serious, it made you cry. But there's not really a call to action like go buy Coke now. Maybe subliminally that's in there, but it's not, it's not obvious, right? Um, so that second piece, I think, doesn't suffer from having a call to action except in our conversation of all pieces should have a call to action, right? Commercials oftentimes don't, and they're still as effective. They're still effective, obviously. I saw a hand somewhere. Yes? I would just say the second one felt like a seed. Yes, as good commercials are, right? That's all. I thought that was its point, is just to get everyone thinking about the future and the seed, and it didn't really have much more of a purpose than that. Yeah. Got a whole flurry of ideas here. Um, I would just venture to say that the second one did a lot to um, reverse the stigma of public transportation, actually, by framing it in such a cool, hip way that I could see it competing with an Uber commercial, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. So even though there's not, as you said, a particular call to action, I think that the framing in particular was a good thing for the perception of public transit. Correct. Yeah. Uh, here, here, and then I saw a hand back in the back, yeah. Um, so as I get up and go to work tomorrow, Monday morning, um, I have a question for you. Um, in the work that I do, um, I work for a consulting firm, and we don't necessarily have the budget from public agencies to make videos. So I'm curious what your, maybe, or the audience as well, the key takeaways would be as um, my myself and my colleagues write website text or I'm giving a pub presentation at a public meeting or I'm giving a presentation to um, a city staff group. Um, how can I take what I learned here and really apply it to those kind of things that I'll be doing tomorrow? <laughs> that is how I wanted to wrap the session. So I want to get the other comments in really quickly. I'm just looking at the time where we're uh, like running, it, but I want to I want to end there. Maybe related as an answer or one piece of the answer, there was not one clip it, well, there are a few clips, but of that second video focused entirely on the people that it was going to be benefiting. Mm. Like, there was not one scene where you didn't see somebody smiling or playing or going to work or dancing or you name it, uh, interacting with each other. And I think that the human impact of our work gets lost um, in the technical jargon. And that was something that I really appreciated uh, about the second video. Yeah. Back in the back. All the way in. Just wanted to talk about the second one. I felt like it was a movie trailer. Uh, and I think, again, it goes back to the whole point of not having a call to action. Uh, but aside from being a movie trailer, I think the music, the, the voice, the, the pitch of voice of the narrators, everything was working towards like uh, the climax of, of, the, of the clip. And so I, I don't know, I, I, I felt like it was Something that was definitely f uh, for social media, at least in my opinion. And that's why it was also a minute and some seconds. Right. It was a minute, like, spot on. Maybe a minute and a couple of frames, but it was exactly one minute, 60 seconds. Um, coming back to the, the question, comment uh, about how do I take this and make it work? Um, by failing a lot. So we have to uh, think about going back to our places of work and incorporating visual storytelling in with a certain element, a spirit of play, that we're not going to get this right the first time out. That we have to learn from some hard-won mistakes, just like every creative ever does. The agency that you hired last time to do the piece that did amazing work did guaranteed did not do amazing work their first time out. Right? None of them individually or collectively. So it goes back to that piece of, of vulnerability, like giving yourselves, and this is hard in public policy, I'm sure, as it is in just all aspects of life, giving yourself permission to fail and then figure out what you did wrong and just not do that thing again, right? Um, 
I'm still failing forward fast. I have a very entrepreneurial mindset. Someone comes to me with a project, I'm like, ooh, I've never done that before. Part of me got, wants to go, I can't do it. The other part of me is like, get that money and we'll figure it out on the way. Fake it, fake it till you make it, right? Um, but I think going down, or like the part that we've done today, talking about just story structure, gives you a bit of a framework. Now the technicals start to come into play. And that's something that we're gonna look at in this afternoon session or the, the second session. Can so, I give a tidbit? Yeah. Yeah, just know that we're all natural storytellers. So just because you're a transportation planner doesn't mean you're not a storyteller. You tell the story about your transportation planning projects like you would tell a story to your mom or your dad about what you did today. It's the same thing. You're really thinking about the other person. How are they receiving the information? Why would they even be listening to you? How can they be part of your story? It's... It's, we're born natural storytellers, even though we're not all transportation planners. I think final thought I wanted to pick up on what you said, like really thinking about, especially if we're tr trying to communicate a new process or a new initiative, thinking about the real world impacts, those emotional things. Like there were shots in that second piece that had nothing to do with transportation at all. It was just a bunch of kids and like, I'm assuming like their coach or something, just pointing and laughing, right? And it's implied in that story that that, community has come together because of transportation. It might have been grabbed from stock video of somewhere, but like because we had the shot of a train before it and the shot of a bus after it, it's assumed that, oh, you know, taking public transit means more opportunities for me to laugh and play and have fun, right? Um, there's so much more that we could uh, talk about and have fun with, but uh, sadly we are at the end of workshop number one.